Hello, everyone. I am here with a presidential candidate, Marianne Williamson, running in the 2024 Democratic Party primary against Joe Biden. And she is here to talk about her campaign. Full disclosure, though, I do intend on voting for Marianne in the upcoming 2024 Oregon primary. So, you know, my biases, I'm laying it all out there. That doesn't necessarily mean that I won't ask hard questions, but I think it's important for viewers that they know who the interviewer is, where they're coming from, because you never see that on mainstream media. But Marianne, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you, and thank you for the endorsement. Thank you for the for the vote of confidence. Thank you so much for what you just said. Yeah, absolutely. I think that most of my viewers already knew that, and I'm pretty sure I said it like once you announced, so it's not necessarily a secret. But I think it's just like you know, it's better for transparency's sake. You know, I support you. You are so far. You have the best shot. I, I would say that you are, and this is according to polls, Biden's biggest competitor in the primary. So there's a big village poll that was just released that shows you at 14 percent. And I think that this headline from John Nichols in The Nation puts everything into perspective. So he writes, Marianne Williamson is polling just as well against Biden as Nikki Haley is against Trump. And he adds, but the media is obsessed with Haley and paying almost no attention to Williamson. So I think that there's a number of reasons why this could be the case. Part of it could be that this is intentional. Part of it could be that they just don't care. Why do you think you're not getting as much attention as these GOP contenders? I think there's a big unspoken edict that fills the ethers of the political and mili uh, the political media industrial complex. Uh, whatever you do, don't let that woman have a viral moment. Whatever you do, don't let her into the conversation. You know, last time they were content to just ridicule and deride me. This time, oh, it's she's not getting she's not even getting in the door to be in the conversation that we have decided it's Joe and we will book no dissent. And it's it is, I think, that intentional, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I know that <clears throat> media can be make or break for a lot of campaigns. Um, you know, we've seen the ways that they restricted Bernie in uh, in 2016. Um, not as much in 2020 because, you know, you can't once you get a certain amount of name recognition. Here's what I'm curious about. Do you think it's possible that you can still pull off an upset despite this media blackout? Because it has happened. It's difficult, right? Especially for candidates like you who are grassroots funded. In 2018, AOC beat Joe Crowley despite a media blackout. And there's a really funny tweet, actually, from Joanne Reed of MSNBC, where she says, pretty much all of political journalism are doing an Ocasio-Cortez crash course tonight, myself included. So it wasn't just that they were ignoring her. A lot of them didn't even know about her. So is it possible that you can still just sheer by force of grassroots organizing, pull off an upset in, say, Iowa or New Hampshire? Or do you think that the media really is a crucial component here? Well, one district, Queens, New York, was not that difficult for uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to drive around, make herself known. But we have a whole country here. So when you have a complete erasure and invisibilization on CNN, on MSNBC, my problem has been uh, how, how many people in the United States don't even know that my campaign exists. Mm -hmm. So if they don't know that your campaign exists, they... Uh, you know, nobody's going to send you any money. They don't even know you exist. And then even among the independent media, there's been a lot of, you know, there hasn't been a, there have been some exceptions for which I'm extremely grateful. But even among the independents, even on the left, there's this revert elitism uh, for whatever reason. It's almost a feeling of, well, we want what she says, but we just wish it wasn't her. Um, mm. Or let's not send her money or whatever. So uh, it's, the blockages have been pretty extreme. The difference mm. is, and the reason that even running on fumes, we've able, been able to get those uh, numbers on the polls that we have, is because when people listen, when people actually show up, you know, I have a lot of people, even among people who agree with me politically, who seem to, you know, people who opine about my books, who've never read my books, mm -hmm. people who have this stereotype, of my career, of my personality, who know nothing about me. And so they won't come hear me. Well, when people come hear me, we're gold. Because I am saying what not just people on the left are saying, I'm saying what I think the majority of people in America are saying. The majority of Republicans as well as Democrats want tuition-free college. The majority of Republicans as well as Democrats, not as much of a majority, but still a majority, want tuition-free college and tech school. The majority, you know, if you actually look at... Um, the polls, the American people are a little bit left of center. I'll tell you, Mike, my, mm -hmm. um, my, my campaign this time 
leads me to believe, as it did last time, the American people are not the problem. The problem is a sclerotic political system that acts like a lid being held down, um, seeking to suppress the full expression of the will of the people. And like I said, you know, um, this kind of weird invisibilization has been true even among people I would not have expected it from. Mm. Amy Goodman, really? Um, mm. Almost derision from... But like I said, when I'm out there with people, especially young people, um, it's exciting, it's electric, it's exhilarating, and it's it's working. Yeah. So can you pull off an upset? Uh, you know, if you had said that to the abolitionists, it wouldn't have been reasonable to think they could, or to the women's suffragists, mm -hmm. or to the early labor organizers, or to the civil rights workers. But I don't think that any of those people proceeded because there was some guarantee win. They proceeded because they felt it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm doing this. Somebody needs to do this. Somebody needs to say those things. You say them. A lot of us say them. But I don't believe you can leave electoral politics out of the larger formula uh, mm. or in any serious uh, effort to fundamentally change things. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, I like your answer there. I like that you also talked about like there's a lid kind of keeping uh, the will of the people kind of suppressed. And we're seeing this right now in action with regard to the ceasefire, for example. I mean, multiple polls have shown majority support for Americans, especially among Democrats. And that's not something that is even a possibility, at least according to the Biden administration's rhetoric. I wanted to ask you about that, by the way. So when it comes to Israel-Palestine, Biden is fundamentally at odds with his base. So I'm curious how you would defer on this policy and where your biggest disagreements with the Biden administration is. Well, I've been calling for a ceasefire from the very beginning. Um, the day of October 7th, I appreciated the president's moral clarity. The next day, however, he said, I'm going to be meeting with Jewish American leaders uh, today. I would have said, had I been president, I'm going to be meeting with both Jewish and Arab American leaders today, um, particularly Palestinian American leaders. America's uh, highest ally should be humanity itself. So ceasefire, immediate ceasefire, there's, there's no... This is wrong-minded on every level, this military action of theirs. Mm -hmm. um, immediate ceasefire, uh, release of the hostages, and immediate architecture for a two-state solution. To me, that is absolutely the only way. Would you be open to the idea of a one-state solution with equal rights? And I ask this because more and more, there's been a lot of individuals, including Israeli scholars like Avi Shlain, for example, who don't think that a two-state solution is any longer possible just because there's so many settlements. Like, for example, in the West Bank, I think the number is 750,000 Israeli settlements. So how do you do two-state given this situation currently? Is one state something that would be on the table for you or that you would consider? Or do you think that two state really is the only path forward? Well, I realize it's something that would have to be resurrected, but those settlements have never been legal. They've never been right. legal. Those people shouldn't be there. So to say, oh, there's 750,000, where do you put them? Back to where they were, I'm sorry. I'm a practical woman. When you talk about one state, if ever, if ever there was a prospect for a bloody civil war, it's one state. It's like La La Land. Who's going to govern this one state? I mean, it's, you, you think it's bad now? Them not even living right there together. So I believe that it's going to be um, quite a long time mm. before a one state is, is uh, desirable there. Yeah. You know, I heard somebody, I thought this was so American. Somebody said, there needs to be just a one state and it needs to be secular. And I thought, if ever there was an American blind spot. Here are two people who are very clear that their religions matter. And here's this American progressive coming in saying, and they'll both, it'll be a secular country. And so we're going to impose that. So I, I uh, to me, uh, they both deserve uh, and need sovereign states, mm -hmm. both of them. Easy, no, but one state is, that doesn't, in any way to me solve a problem.
Well, here's what I, what I will say to that. So a lot of folks were also fearful of, you know, internal disputes with the end of apartheid in South Africa. And on top of that, the other argument, the counter argument is, you know, prior to the Balfour Declaration, there was peace. You know, Arabs and Jewish people, for the most part, lived in that area. And the Jewish population was much smaller, you know, but, um, you know, there was relative peace. So this is kind of the thinking of individuals like Avi Shlaim, you know, um, and, and how it is it is po- even though it's inconceivable now, it is something that could be possible. What would you say to that? I would say that when you the days that you're talking about, there were tribes wandering around. There were no nation states. There wasn't a nation state. There weren't any states at all. But that's very different than one state. And in today's world, there's going to be a state. So you, it's, not, it's not like we can go back to that. And uh, I don't believe that the entire state of Israel is apartheid. There are apartheid laws. I believe that there is a, you know, clearly the West Bank is, clearly the settlements are. But, uh, you know, there are Arabs in the Knesset. It's, I, I do not, I'm not enrolled in the idea that this is not South Africa for me, to me. Mm. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, let me ask you this, because you do support a ceasefire, which I think is the bare minimum. So that is, to me, you passed that test. Um, <laughs> let's take it further, though. I'm curious. I'm curious. For what it's worth, you passed the test. Uh, so here's what I want to ask you. And in the event, way, I think that that's worth noting. Right, true. Very true. Um, so in the event you become president, hypothetically speaking, I would assume that you would uh, sign on to the International Criminal Court. So after... Yeah. Dick Cheney might not be too happy about that or George Bush. You know exactly what I was going to ask you. So, yeah, under with us under their jurisdiction, would you as president not pull an Obama and actually recommend some of your predecessors for prosecution, including Joe Biden? <clears throat> no. I would not. Why not? Because I believe that a lot of forgiveness and a lot of mercy is necessary going forward. And... Um, if, you know, I would certainly not, like, look at someone like, I'm not coming from a George, uh, Gerald Ford place mm-hmm. where he pardoned Richard Nixon because I think it really hurt the nation that he pardoned Richard Nixon, especially mm-hmm. when John Mitchell and Ehrlichman and all those guys, Haldeman, et cetera, had gone to jail. I think Haldeman went. Um, but when I think of the things that I would like to achieve as president and the political capital that you have, having been elected president, I would not be immediately day one. There are a lot of things you could ask me about if I would do day one or if I would do in the first hundred days, joining the criminal court and suggesting Joe Biden, Dick Cheney, and George Bush for criminal prosecution would would be to me the most performative indulgence. Um, to me, those things do not um, represent uh, the serious work of going forward and trying to right either our domestic or our uh, foreign policy uh, malfeasance where it is malfeasance. But what do you say to this idea that if if we never hold people who break international law accountable, that they're going to do it again? I mean, for example, let's say that Henry Kissinger w- was still alive. If you were president, would you even recommend somebody like him who's responsible for four or five million plus deaths? To actually, su- first of all, I think other countries would suggest it. Mm-hmm. I don't think it would be the United States suggesting it. That's really how it works, I think. So, but would you? Huh? Would but, I? But would you? Would I have, yeah. If I were president and we were in the criminal court, would I have suggested it? Henry Kissinger, yeah. I would not have suggested it, but if we were a member of the criminal court, then listen, one of the reasons we should be a member of the criminal court is because some of those things might not have happened if we had been. Mm-hmm. The fact that we were not a member of the criminal court is what made the Dick Cheney's of the world and the Henry Kissinger's of the world feel such permission to carry out their imperialistic, uh, militaristic tirades to begin with. That's why I think we should be on the court. Okay, okay. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about worker rights, specifically with regard to your campaign. So you've addressed this before, but there's been about two dozen plus campaign staffers who accuse you of creating a hostile work environment. They've accused you of emotional abuse. They've said that you've made them sign strict NDAs. And you have addressed this and you said that if all of these folks were under oath, that you would not be convicted uh, by a jury of your peers. And I think that that's fair. Uh, Having said that, though, I think that this is still going to be a sticking point to a lot of people because worker rights, those of us who have been in that predicament where we've seen bad bosses, 
we are very sensitive to this employer employee dynamic specifically because that can foster abuse because of that power imbalance. For me, I've had horrible bad bosses that have given me depression, anxiety, they've abused me. But on top of that, I was also on the other side where as a boss, I felt like in hindsight, I probably could have spoken to my subordinates with more respect. So just being on both sides there, not to both sides anything, but like from that perspective, I'm curious what you would say to folks who are still concerned about this. And if these allegations have changed you in the sense that you're, you've kind of revisited the way that you speak to employees, or you've instituted any new policies in the workplace, or if you have taken any of their recommendations to heart, such as hiring a, a comms director and a data director, because another, another complaint is that you haven't taken what they've said seriously. So just kind of talk me through it and what you'd say to address this. Okay, so in the campaign last time, I definitely said the F word fucking shit too often. Mm -hmm. Not at people, by the way, but in the presence of people. I like to think that I've grown or whatever, but I have seen enough men in the office. I've seen Bill Clinton in the White House get angry. I have read enough about Bill, uh, about every male person who is running. I've read about them. Uh, the idea that mine is worse, uh, no. In this campaign, there are people with whom I never had a cross word, never had a cross word. I actually thought we had a nice relationship who've come up with this stuff about me. I'm sorry. Um, somebody said they didn't take the, take the advice of the pros. Are you kidding? Somebody who worked for GameStop and is now telling me how the book publishing works, that I'm doing this uh, to sell books. Well, let me tell you something, Mike. I have sold some books, and the way to sell books in my field, spiritual books, is to never mention politics. Abuse can go both ways. So do I hope that over the years I have learned something about how to treat employees? I think I, I'm sure you have too. I hope I'm a better person. And that the stuff from last time, even though a lot of it was, oh, yeah, really? You know, sometimes underperformers take any kind of accountability as an attack. But did I yell the curse word too much and yell and, you know, yeah, I did. But this time, anybody, what I have seen on this campaign about how politics works, I'm sorry. Anybody who, people have no idea, and I do. And when it comes to a lot of that stuff, the person who's been abused here is me. Including by all the people who repeat those stories and embellish those stories who were not there and don't know what they're talking about, who talk about my books who've never read my books, who talk about my personality who've never spent any time with me, or even how I work with, with employees. So am I a perfect person? No. And how, do I hope that I've become better in that area as in any other area? Yeah, especially with that having lost my temper and stuff. But, you know, people said I threw a phone or people said I hit a car door many times. No, I turned around, it was too fast and I was upset and I, and I hit my finger. Mm. So there's a limit past which, no. Ask Bobby Kennedy, ask Cornell. If, if Bobby Kennedy's, if Bobby Kennedy, you know, Dennis Kucinich is gone, all you read is that Dennis Kucinich is gone. If me and mine, Oh, she's a crazy woman. We all know how she is, and she can't keep anyone. She won't listen to anyone. No, I'm done with it. I, uh, I, I, I'm not a perfect person. I hope to be better. But some of the stuff that's been said about me has been from people with whom I never had a cross word. People who I thought, oh, he's nice. Why don't we hire him? No. So do I? Hope I appreciate. I appreciate you saying that, you know, you could have done things better and you're trying to learn because here's the thing. We're all just human beings. We are on this floating rock through space and we're trying our best, you know, and sometimes we fall short. Sometimes we we were accused of doing something we didn't do. It happens. One, one thing that I will say is that when it comes to mainstream media, I, I think that it's fair to say that there's this double standard where female candidates, these stories get public, uh, publicized much more than male candidates. I think that's totally fair. That's On not the, this mainstream media, though. That's independent media, too. Well, here's why, though. Here's why. I think that when it comes to a candidate like Bobby Kennedy, for example, mm -hmm. he's a fraud. 
you're not. When it comes to these Republicans, Bill Clinton, they are frauds. I expect nothing but the worst from them. So when there is this type of allegation about a leftist candidate, it does give me pause because I think that for progressives, for better or worse, we're held, held to a much higher standard, right? And so when it's really easy, like, again, going back to a lot of people who have been in this predicament, it's very easy to sympathize with these claims because we've all been there with these horrible bosses, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that, I think it's one thing. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm not disagreeing with you, but if we hold ourselves to a higher standard, then why don't we look at our own misogyny? Well, do you think two things could be true at once? Perhaps yeah. maybe maybe these employees, you know, sure, there's some wrong and maybe they they would look at you differently because you're a woman. But also there's some truth maybe to, yeah, you know, you you were a little bit emotionally abusive. Like, I, I think that two things can be true. Like, do you think that it's possible? That over, yeah, actually. You know, when I think about what emotional abuse is, I think that word has become so trendy. Everything's abusive. Like I said, underperformers take any kind of accountability as an attack. One person's abuse is another person holding someone accountable. The emotionality that I displayed on the first campaign, yeah. But this, this, this time, this concerted effort to, and people saying do not vote for her, people with whom I never had a cross word, Mike. People who never had, who could not say that I'd ever done anything to them or to, uh, I, no, I, I mean, there's a level, I mean, I know that, you know, just apologize and say you're sorry. Well, I apologize for mistakes I've made and, mm -hmm. and this has got, this is, and. Yeah. Yeah, and you kind of feel like it's there's no taking yes to this place, and this holier than thou. Oh, well, we're for mm. work. You know, no, mm, there's a limit past. It's um, I feel I did almost too much apologizing at the time because it was almost like it, it, this stuff came at me, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm just mm. now, and I think about that, and I spent a lot of nights and thinking my actual interactions with people, and that business you were saying she should have listened to the pros. Who's who's the one who's run for president twice here? I could, I could, I could tell you things that would surprise you. Hmm. So it kind of seems like to me, it's, it feels like you've kind of, you've done your best to address this and take accountability, but a lot of folks won't take yes for an answer. And, right. you, and they don't and, want to, and if I may, they don't want to, because, you know, there's a, an old f a phrase, contempt prior to investigation. Hmm. And I have come to, ex there is this irrational animus against me. And I feel with some people, they might say it's just that, but those are the same people who call me crystal lady. And I think some people just don't, they don't like me. And it doesn't mm -hmm. seem, because if they, I mean, if you have had any kind of public whatever, you see stories written about other people, public figures quite differently. None of which is to say that I'm a perfect person. None of which to say I haven't had um, my moments. Not that, you know, or that, you know, I've said things that were, you know, should have been said differently, all that stuff. And of course, I hope to be better and a different person, obviously. Mm -hmm. But there's something else going on here. I see. Dark, in my mm. opinion. Okay. One last thing on this su subject, and then uh, I want to get to healthcare. So here's what I would say. Just from my perspective, if I am not convinced, and I'm not saying that that's my position, but if I were not convinced, some things that I would that I saw that would change my mind would be perhaps you endorsing a unionization or after the oh, election. I have. My okay. God, I was on the oh my goodness, I was on the UAW strike. I was out with Christian Smalls the other day. In well, staff. of your employees specifically, of your staffers, oh, would you yeah, support that? Staff said they wanted to to unionize. Yeah. Okay. Would yeah, you consider I mean, after the election releasing them from their NDAs? What? Why is? What's? What? What is that for? After I've been treated the way I have been by people lying to me the way they have who have broken them, I don't know. I think that's not unionization. Where is that? I, I don't understand. And every every political campaign, they have NDAs. I mean, that's it's a part of. Oh, well, you're I, not I, any political campaign. You're better. 
But why, I see, you say that as though an NDA, I have worked for many people with whom I've, I've had NDAs. I think I, I worked for Oprah Winfrey. I, I mean, I've worked for all kinds of people with whom I think they had a reasonable, a reasonable claim on the importance of confidence within the office space. Hmm. I, I don't see what's wrong. I mean, you say so, that so there's something wrong with an NDA. I mean, I, I'd have to think about that, but I don't see what's wrong with that contract. From the perspective of leftists, and this is my take, I don't speak for all leftists, NDAs are another form of control from employers. They, you know, our employers most of the time, not with not with respect to like campaigns, but they control the way that we dress. They control where we have to be. They control our livelihoods and they also control speech. So this is another form of control that leads to that power imbalance. So that's kind of why people view NDAs myself included, arguably, uh, depending on the NDA and the circumstance, because I've turned down jobs based on NDAs that I've had to sign myself. Um, it's just it's a form of free speech suppression in the minds of folks. So that's kind of like not to accuse you of sit, saying you're trying to do that. That's just one of the instances where people kind of see an NDA and they take pause, if that makes sense. Well, if they do, then they, you know, I mean, I, I don't see it that way. To me, it's no different than anonymity in a meeting, you know. Sure. And no, a, that's a, fair. A meeting or confidence uh, with your therapist. It's a, your therapist isn't going to say what went on here. And I think sometimes that's really important. Okay. Yeah. No, so I think that's, that's fair. I, see it. I think just yeah. emotional safety. And it goes okay. both ways. The NDA goes both ways, you know. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I do want to move on. I want to talk about healthcare. So, healthcare, if you go to your website, you have a book on healthcare. Uh, it is beautiful to see that because a lot and i mean book in terms of like your policy platform there's a lot there you uh, and, it. i wrote a book about health <laughs> i mean you could you could right uh yeah, you know well, we have many uh, many issues on that website that, that i'm very proud of actually it's great and it's nice to see another presidential candidate take healthcare seriously because i felt like this was it like with bernie 2020 2016 are we ever going to get somebody who takes it this seriously and my hat goes off to you honestly your healthcare. um Policies are great. Uh, there's a couple things that I want to ask you about, though. Uh, just nail down on some specifics. Uh, and this is really like we're getting in the weeds here. But I know that you love the policy wonkery and stuff like that. And I'm, I do, too. I'm really curious about it. So when it comes to specifics, um, one thing that I didn't see on your platform is what would you do? You, you mentioned hospitals um, and how to rein in the prices. Would you be open? And this is a big, this is not something that's really discussed. Uh, would you be open to nationalizing hospitals to create a sort of UK type plan? And I'm also curious what the role, if any, private insurance providers would play in your healthcare system. You know, when it comes to health insurance, there are many different ways of doing it. You have New Zealand, you have Australia, you have Germany, you have uh, England, you have all different systems. And I haven't seen any that are perfect, but I see really good things in all of them. And all of them also are not the United States. So there has to be, mm -hmm. you know, the best minds brought together for what is most applicable here. Uh, it, to me, the, the bottom line is that we must have universal health care. I believe in a Medicare for all type system. Now, some people say there should therefore be no private insurance allowed because anything like that would circumvent the system. There are other countries where they do believe that there should be some allowance for uh, private insurance additionally. Uh, that's, 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 there's a struggle between those, those two beliefs. And so we have to see what is possible for the United States. In terms of hospitals, a hospital industrial complex is certainly a problem. But at the same time, I like to think in terms of a hybrid economy. I like to think in terms of, look, there's a high side to the, to the free market. Uh, but as Adam Smith said, free market capitalism cannot exist outside an ethical context. So what's happened now is that the corporatist model has no morals. It has no ethics. If the bottom line is short-term profit for stockholder class, then that is always at the expense, in this case, of the patient, at the expense of, of, of workers, at the expense of nurses, at the expense of doctors, and so forth, um, wherever necessary. So I would like to begin with guardrails. You know, I don't, I, 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 the, you know, with a vision, I once read a book that said, with a vision, you must not compromise. Politics is the art of compromise. 
I'm not going to, you know, come in. If, if I'm president of the United States, I'm not going to come in and we're going to nationalize oil. We're going to nationalize energy. I mean, we're going to nationalize. We're going to nationalize. Oil. I'm not going to. I know you'd like that, but that's not. That's not. <laughs> that's start here. You know, it's like, and we're going to prosecute him because you even though he's dead posthumously. You know, no, no. We want blood, Marianne. <laughs> turn the ship around, Mike. You know, sure. this is not performative stuff. This is real. Um, yeah, I want to be a wise and responsible left-wing guardian of the country. I, and I appreciate that. Uh, one thing that I want to say about um, private insurance, and I have been one of the more annoying pushers of Medicare for All, who is very insistent on we need to destroy all private insurance companies. And it was ever since I read this paragraph from Adam Gaffney in 2019 uh, that it just clicked with me. And I was hoping that I could read this paragraph to you because I think it really puts it into perspective how unnecessary these private insurance companies are. So he argues, and this is a physician, part of a physician, uh, National Nurses United. Um, so the only, or I'm sorry, not National Nurses United, Physicians for Single Payer, something like that. I'll put, I'll put it down below. But the only way to make room for a significant role for private insurance in the American context is to make the public system paltrier or skimpier, to impose onerous co-pays and deductibles, or to let the rich preferentially displace working class people from hospital beds and doctor's offices. But it it doesn't seem to make sense to punch holes in your own floor just to create work for a carpenter. That is particularly true if your floor is your healthcare and your carpenter is an extractive insurance agent. So I, I say this about um, private insurance companies because if you if you carve out a role for them, you and you you reference this too to be fair you kind of yeah, like open the argument very well you open yeah, the I, door to where you give them an inch they're going to take a mile they're going to push for privatization we're seeing like even with the uk like i think that their healthcare is the gold standard but they are trying the tories are trying to privatize more and more of it uh same is happening happening in australia so would you be and i know that you you want to be realistic but would you start negotiations perhaps of no no private insurance well, just to try you, to see how far you can push it but you just said yourself, you said you saw England as the gold standard and they do have the cases where you could have the private insurance. Well, that's diminishing because of the private. That's kind of like why I'm so worried, right? Because if and currently they don't have all, you know, publicly owned hospitals about I want to say like 10 percent are privately owned. I think it should be zero percent. I think there should be no privatization. But I just worry that like, OK, let's say we get single pair 2025 when you become president by 2040. You know, it could look completely different just because they chip away little by little. And that's really the fear. I want to build something that lasts for generations, like Social Security. I think that the policy, the way that was designed, has made it so that way it is future proof. And there's, there's currently attempts to, you know, chip away at it, uh, privatization. But it hasn't lasted because it's it's the way it was designed was crucial. So that's kind of like my pitch for getting rid of private insurance or at least starting negotiations there. What I can say to you is I'm more with you than not. Okay. But the but the struggle will always be there. That struggle will right. outlast any president. Uh, mm -hmm. So so, and you know I look at Scandinavian countries. I look at the hybrid models. I, I um, I'm more with you than not. Okay. But I also understand. I also understand some of the problems that occur, as well. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. That's all we can ask for from a presidential mm -hmm. candidate. I like that. Um, on the subject of healthcare, yeah. so I felt like for the first time, at least in my lifetime, I don't know if there were any other instances of this, but we actually experimented with free healthcare in a very limited capacity with the COVID nineteen vaccines. Uh, there was a Commonwealth Fund study released last November, I want to say, and they determined that they saved three million lives, prevented eighteen million plus hospitalizations, and we saved over a trillion bucks. So to me, I view that as a microcosm of what Medicare for all would look like. If you take that and you extrapolate how this could look in other, uh, you know, other other uh, areas. And this is what the studies also show as well. Right. There was a Harvard study pre pandemic, by the way, that shows Medicare for all would save 68000 lives. We would also uh, save on overall spending. And so I felt like, man, the COVID-19 vaccines that's that's the test like we that's the test but i have to be honest it be done. Ex exactly we you funded know, it it can't be done it's like well didn't you just do it 
literally. So <laughs> it's it's mind boggling to me that in the year 2023, we're still talking about this as if it's impossible when other countries do it when we did it and we save lives, lives and money. Uh, but on the subject of COVID vaccines, I had something to nitpick with you about, okay? So bear with me. So on the June 20 to, uh, 26th episode of Breaking Points, you said something that was really disappointing to me about the COVID vaccines. You said, one of the things that really upset me during the COVID vaccine was how little conversation was even allowed about treatment, whether it was ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. And then you later added, uh, the CDC and the administrations were both using the media to focus on this idea, no, it's got to be just the COVID vaccines. Now, I know that you were specifically trying to emphasize the need for transparency and public trust in these institutions. But I felt like that was really disappointing because you kind of lended credence to the claims of folks like Robert Kennedy and Joe Rogan, who are trying to undermine the vaccine when a single payer advocates, this should be the thing that we are screaming from the rooftops. This vaccine worked. It worked really well, not just because we're trying to bolster our single payer arguments, although that's important, but it worked because uh, the evidence, the data shows that. So can you expound upon that a little bit? Because I, I felt when I saw that, I was really disappointed because I felt like this is not the Marianne that I know who is kind of lending credence to this argument. I, just talk me through it. I think my articulation was a little sloppy. I think my articulation was a little sloppy there. But I do have a problem when voices are suppressed. And I, and I did wonder at the time why there wasn't more conversation about treatment. But I think to extrapolate from that, that I was in the Bobby Kennedy camp is really far. No, I wouldn't say that. No, I wouldn't say that. I I would argue that um, it inadvertently legitimized that kind of argument. And look, the reason why this is something that was really concerning to me, um, and, and not just you, like whenever I hear the argument, like the Joe Rogan argument that like, man, why can't we even talk about this? I don't understand why this is going on. I feel like it was one of the few instances where the media was actually doing its job because the vaccines were working and ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine were not. And for me, it's a little bit more personal because I have a grandmother and we don't know all of the details. She was in a nursing home and we believe that she contracted COVID-19 from the nursing home. Although when she was finally admitted into the hospital, she was testing negative. But we think that she got pneumonia from having COVID-19. Don't know. Uh, she died and she didn't get the vaccine because my aunties convinced her that this was going to kill her. It was, it was deadly. And they were these people that were, no, you got to go with, you know, ivermectin, alternate treatments. And so for me, I, I felt like, man, this is not one of those instances where we should we should just cavalier discuss these alternatives like Joe Rogan did, for example, one one thing that stood out to me and not to make this about Joe Rogan, but just as an example of, you know, he said, if you're a young person, would I recommend you get the vaccine? no. And so, you know, to me, this is this is one of those instances where what what are we doing? Right. Like I, I support Medicare for all because I support saving lives. I support the vaccine and was trying my best to tell people do not take ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. The vaccine at this time and this was during like Delta Wave 2021. This is the way to go. And, you know, it's not because I'm, I'm a big pharma shill. I want to nationalize all of them. I want to I want to jail these CEOs. It's because. This is what is going to save lives. And I think there were so many countless lives lost because there were people like Joe Rogan who irresponsibly addressed these alternatives under the pretense of free speech when he had no expertise. So that's kind of like that's where I'm coming from. And I'm not saying that, you know, you're part of that. I don't want I don't want you to think that that's that's the takeaway here. I just think that, you know, and, and you you said that, you know, you, you don't think that you worded it as well as you could have. You know, when I saw that, I thought, oh, Marianne, come on. I know you don't I know you don't think this. You are a single parent advocate through and through. No, and I, I certainly, I, I was vaccinated. And if I'd had a grandmother in a, you know, a nursing home, I mean, absolutely, I would have said, got to get that vaccine and so right, forth. Right, right. And I'm so sorry about your loss. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, she, to be fair, like she was in her 90s. So we, we were, as soon as the, you know, we started to hear these stories about older people in nursing home, you know, it was, it was horrifying, but yeah, it, no, I yeah, that's kind of person to say we've got to get her vaccinated immediately. Yeah, uh, there's unfortunately just one member uh, of the family who was pushing that, you know, she lives in she lived in Hawaii. So, uh, you know, uh, my side couldn't didn't have any influence over it. I had one uncle who was trying, but everyone else 
they instilled the fear of God into her, you know, with regard to the vaccine. So, yeah, that I, I appreciate you, uh, you know, saying that you misspoke there. And I, I'm glad that you clarified and you said you said just for the record, you know, vaccines are good. And of course, gotten it. of course, of course. Yes. Good, That's good, good. So good. OK, good. OK, good. Because I I've seen stories and this kind of dates back to like the the 90s um 90s era Marianne where I think that they tried to portray you as anti-vax but after I see that no, and I'm no, very no, sensitive I, never, I don't think that no, that's accurate. you didn't see stories about me talking about vaccinations in the 1990s no I think that they try they tried to insinuate that you were there's been a lot of uh, Back false in insinuations because I said something about mandates this was long before COVID I made a comment about mandates. okay I had never made an anti-vaccine comment no I'm not saying you were I'm saying that the media they, 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 they make these insinuations. One, and, and I want to move on to queer rights because there's one insinuation that was really shocking to me. Uh, and you, I think that you address this very, very artfully. So you got one of the people who you helped during the AIDS crisis to do a campaign ad for you. And this was in response to the view Sonny Hostin effectively saying that you told AIDS patients to not take their medicine. And I saw this and I didn't have any evidence to the contrary. I didn't know how to look this up. And I thought, oh my God, if this is true, this is horrible. But then to hear your side of the story, it was infuriating because, you know, during the AIDS crisis, you know, gay people were like taboo. You know, nobody wanted to be around them, their own family members. So to hear that you were there actually speak treating them like human beings speaking to them that as a member of the community i was very touched by that uh explain your reasoning because i just to put everyone who wasn't alive during that that time myself included uh everybody thought that this like weird gay disease was contagious but you were right there with them explain your thinking because i don't think that a lot of people understand how how bad it was at the time to be gay and to be around gay people, but you were there. So explain your thinking, because I think this is so important and it speaks to like how we can all be better as allies. It's not about my thinking, it's about my experience. I was giving lectures on a set of books called A Course in Miracles. And A Course in Miracles is not a religion. It is a system of spiritual psychotherapy that has to do with the relinquishment of a thought system based on fear, the acceptance instead of a thought system based on love. It's just about being more loving. When I start, I started lecturing in 1983. Soon thereafter, this disease, and it was very similar to what happened with COVID, and that all of a sudden, it's all you hear about. But it was the opposite of COVID. And the COVID was very easy to get, but the chances were you would survive. Uh, AIDS was the opposite, very hard to get, the chances were you would die. So it took, first of all, Western medicine, much like with COVID, it wasn't like it wasn't trying. Nobody thought Western medicine wasn't trying, but they kept coming up. There was this disease. They couldn't, they, 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 nothing was working. People were just dying everywhere. And in addition to that, the organized religions were eerily silent because they were working out their own, you know, homophobic stuff, et cetera, so silence. So here was this woman, I was at the time in my early 30s, talking over the, in the Los Feliz area of LA about a God who loves us no matter who we are, what we've done, and, and how when we love each other enough, anything is possible. And so gay men started coming to my lectures. And it started becoming this thing. And we couldn't guarantee that someone couldn't, wouldn't die, but we could guarantee that nobody was going to die alone. Mm. And so I would be giving lectures two or three times a week. We would, in the days that I wasn't lecturing, we were doing support groups. And then I um, wanted a house where we could all, because we would be giving these support groups uh, at people's apartments. And then I would say, well, you know, so-and-so could really use a massage. Is there anybody with massage or anything? We'd start make, I'd make appointments in this little pink book I had. And then I was like, well, why don't we rent a house? And I started talking at my lectures about how we should have a house where everybody could be because we were all holding on to each other so much at these lectures and the support groups, but I knew people needed it all day, every day. So David Geffen, I don't know if 
your generation still knows who David Geffen is and if he's still. I'm not sure myself. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, well, David Geffen, a gay billionaire, um, and uh, he called me one day. He had been at the at the talk with his lover that morning. He said, uh, "I hear you want to. I heard you say you wanted to start a a, a house for people who are HIV." I said, "Yeah, I want to. I want to start a house and." And it'll be really great because people can come over and then they, uh, you know, people can have, it can be like an all day support group and people will be there and people can get massages and people will come in and just give therapy and just donate their services and we'll have food. And then people who are ill, you know, it'll be a place where everybody can be at non-medical support services. And he said, um, how much would this cost you? And I said, oh, I, I think we can do it for $5,000. And he said, and I don't know if he was laughing on the other side of the line or not. He said, oh, really? What was the, where's the 5,000? What's for? I said, well, and I'm so naive at that time about who he is and who he was. I said, well, the rent with the house on Sierra Bonita in West, in West Hollywood. I said, the rent is 2,500. But see, the way they do it is you have to pay first and last also. Yeah. He said, oh, really? So I'm informing him, <laughs> which is very funny if you know who David Geffen is. He said, really? I said, yeah. I, I said, so that's your 5,000? I said, yeah. He said, well, won't you need money for staff? And I said, no, 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 we're all going to be there. It's all going to just be volunteering and all that kind of stuff. And he said, okay, well, thank you so much for telling me. And uh, then about an hour later, there was a knock at my door with a check for $50,000 from David Geffen. Wow. So then we had, it was really extraordinary. And then we would have the lectures and the lectures were kind of like, you know, it was like a, almost like a social, it was where people could gather and, it was very beautiful because a lot of people knew. You know, I would hear people, one of the things you would hear a lot of young men say, you, you know, in, in today's world, you can't even imagine this, but this is the mm -hmm. world we were living in then. How many young men were going through all of this anxiety about calling their parents? But the issue about calling their parents was twofold. I have to tell them I'm gay. And I have to tell them I'm dying. And I heard people say it's harder to tell them I'm gay than to tell them I'm dying. Wow. And then what started happening was I remember the day I went in and I said, where's Aiden? And they said, um, no, he's not in today. I said, well, he's always here. Why isn't Aiden here? Well, I can't get, he couldn't get out, you know, he couldn't leave the house today. And I said, well, how's he going to eat? I don't know. I said, oh, okay, we'll have to take the food to him. And so what would happen is people get to the point where we were delivering food. So then we started as a product of that first, and that first Center for Living we also did in New York. Mm. And then, so then we started a project of the Center for Living, which was called Project Angel Food, was a Meals on Wheels homebound home delivery which today has served over 16 million meals. Wow. And because it still exists today, feeding homebound people with critical illness, no matter what their disease in the LA area. And then when we started Project Angel Food, it Hollywood showed up in such a profound way. I mean, you're talking about people like Bette Midler and Elizabeth Taylor. And like, I remember our first fundraiser, you would get things like, um, Frank Geary would design your patio or, uh, I mean, just lunch mm -hmm. with Liza Minnelli. And we made a million dollars that night, I remember. Wow. Uh-huh. So That's so was, cool. It was very beautiful. I and love that story. It was very profound. So when, you know, it's all part and parcel of the same thing, Mike. Yeah. About me. So I, mm -hmm. that I told gay people not to take their medicine. First of all, there wasn't even any medicine. And then when right. they was the last thing I told people or that they got AIDS because they didn't pray enough or it's mm -hmm. all part of the same. She's crazy, kooky. She's horrible. It's very gross because like we all like to think, you know, in hi hindsight is 2020, right? Where we like to think back and say, you know, if if I were alive in this time, I would do X. 
But the truth is, I think a lot of people, a lot of liberals, a lot of very progressive minded people today would not have wanted anything to do with gay people. And so like you, I think this is such a big accomplishment because you can say, I actually know what I would have done. I lived it and I did it. And I think that's so cool. Like, I love the story. It wasn't just what I did. It's what they did for me, too. I mean, uh, they... Uh, it wasn't just me giving, it was me receiving. You know, this was before uh, before gay men, you know, the idea of a gay man adopting a child was something. Mm-hmm. And so, like, when I got pregnant, there were all these gay men in L.A., we're having a baby, we're having a baby. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, uh, it gave me everything, too. It didn't, it, it went both ways, trust me. I lo- that's, yeah, I love that so much. Uh, one of my favorite things to hear. I uh, love that about you. Thank you for that. I think that's great. Um, on, on the subject, one more question about LGBTQ plus rights. It, it, you know, we, we've come so far, you know, since then, thankfully, but there's still so much work to go, uh, you know, uh, and in the last two years, I mean, the backwards movement that we've had with regard to trans issues has been just colossal. And this year alone, the ACLU tracked 500 plus anti-LGBTQ plus bills across the country. A lot of them passed. A lot of them like don't say gay, gender affirming care bans. And now I believe the number is 19 different states. They all ban gender affirming care for trans youth. So what I want to ask you is if you were president, how would you address this? Is this something that you would need to do legislatively? Could you use your pen? Because at the last debate, so the Republicans were implying that they could easily ban gender affirming care um, with a stroke of a pen, they wouldn't need, you know, Congress to do this. So could you do the opposite? You know, could you wipe out these bans with a stroke of the pen? How would you address this? Because this is going to be, I think, the next battle going forward. Well, first of all, you know, you said we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. I see it the opposite. I see it as we've been really, as you then indicated, gone backwards in ways that are really shocking, actually. Yeah. You know, in the development of a nation, just like in the development of an individual, sometimes you take one step forward and two steps back. We thought Mm -hmm. we really, in large part because of AIDS, then you had the human rights. um, What's the organization? Human Human Rights Campaign? Human Rights Campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh Was founded. uh, uh, You know, so really felt like, and then we have marriage equality, really felt like we were just opening up a whole new world of possibility. Right. um, So this has been, these steps backwards have been, part of a larger picture of the barbarism that is mm-hmm. ascendant uh, in, in the world, unfortunately. Uh, first thing I would do, almost the first thing I would do, is um, confer special protection status on uh, transgender Americans. They are a targeted group today. Mm-hmm. They are a targeted group, and I would confer a special protection status on that. Yeah, I know on your, your uh, platform, you say that you would declare uh, violence against trans people and their suicide rights, a national emergency, which is something I haven't seen um, from another candidate, which is, I and I hadn't even thought about that as as an idea. I think that's actually really great. Um, In terms of like gender affirming care, do you think that that declaration would assist you with that? Would that give you the tools that you need to stop these bans um, under the same logic? uh, I have transgender friends who agree with me that nothing non-reversible should be legal until 18. So I think once somebody's 18, they should do whatever they want to do. But the prefrontal cortex isn't even uh, fully developed at 14 or 15. So, um, you know, people talk about how hormone therapy is reversible. There's controversy about that, but at least there's enough of an argument that it's reversible that I'm, to me, that's between a patient and their doctor. What but, uh, yeah. I'm curious because I'm um, I assume that you you supported gender affirming care. Uh, what do you mean by non reversible procedures for trans youth? Uh, like what what specifically do you do? You, do you... For instance, I think if a, if a, uh, a woman decides I'm I'm not actually a woman. I don't want to be in a woman's body. I totally respect that. And as of her 18th birthday, she can do whatever she wants to do. But I believe that that, that there should be some things that are not happening until you're 18. Would you support um, hormone replacement therapy or puberty blockers? Yeah, for hormone replacement therapy is different. There is at least an argument. Now, I've heard some people who who argue with that, but there is enough legitimate claim 
You know, both sides have argument. But to me, there is enough legitimate claim that, yes, it's reversible if they want to later, that I think hormone replacement is should be legal. Okay. How about puberty blockers as well? Well, that's until... what hormone replacement really is. Yeah. Right. So that yeah. way. Okay. So it's the really, it sounds like the one thing that's a sticking point to you is the double mastectomy. We are on penises and all of that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, currently uh, you can't do uh, bottom surgery until you're 18. And you know as well as I do that even when you qualify for that, um, we live in a late stage capitalist hellscape. And if you want to get any surgery, you can't do it. Uh, it's very expensive. I have trans friends who are doing GoFundMes to get surgeries that they need in their 30s. So, yeah, yeah, that I don't necessarily think that people... Uh, would take issue with that. The one thing that I will say is with double mastectomies is that this is such a rare occurrence. And the only time that it is permitted is in circumstances where it's a teen that's like 16 and they have shown persistent gender dysphoria for a very long time at the doctor and parent consents to it. Um, but if that's the only thing that you take issue with, then yeah, as long as, long as you are basically you go with the consensus of science, I think that's that's where we can all we can all agree, which is good. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's, man, we are, we're running out of time here. I don't want to take too much of your time. We didn't get to ask about climate change, but I do want to give you the opportunity. I always do this to candidates to just kind of like make your last pitch. Um, you know, use the microphone now to let people know why you're doing this, why you're running and why you think that they should support you and where they can support you. Well, it's interesting because I, I have a hard time using the word should. I don't think anyone, quote unquote, should support me. I think someone should, as a, in, as a responsibility to yourself and to your country, uh, know what, other, what people are proposing. And um, I do appreciate the opportunity to say what I am actually proposing, as opposed to the fairy dust that is thrown in people's eyes so much. Um, which I think has blocked many people from seeing what I am proposing. I'm proposing an economic bill of rights uh, and taking uh, Franklin Roosevelt's economic bill of rights, moving it into the 21st century. I want universal health care. I want tuition-free college and tech school. I uh, want complete cancellation of the college loan debt. I want subsidized child care. Child care is a real crisis for many Americans. I want paid family leave. I want guaranteed sick pay. I want affordable housing, guaranteed affordable housing, and a guaranteed living wage. In addition to that, I want a Department of Peace. We need to learn to wage peace as effectively as we wage war. Uh, there should be a peace academy, just as there is a military academy. Peace building is a real thing. We should have armies of peace builders, just like we have armies of military personnel. Uh, when there's greater economic opportunities for women, greater educational opportunities for children, a reduction of violence against women, and an amelioration of unnecessary human despair, then there is statistically a higher incidence of peace and a lower incidence of violence. Um, we should imagine a world without war in a hundred years and reverse engineer from there. Just like we play war games, we should play peace games. Some people think that's naive. I think it's what's naive is to think that we are guaranteed survival on this planet for another hundred years if we don't at least try. And the peace, uh, the peace department applies as much, those issues and those elements apply as much to uh, any corner of the United States as any other corner of the world. I also want a Department of Children and Youth. I would be a very child-centric president. If we want a country that is thriving in 20 years, we're going to have to pay far more attention to 10-year-olds today. Everything is an early childhood. We now know about the human brain. 90% of it is developed in the first five years. We have children in America who are traumatized before preschool. We have elementary school students on suicide watch. We have throughout public schools in the country, uh, trauma rooms. And we have to ask ourselves, why should childhood be a trauma for millions of children in the richest country in the world? To me, children are the primary example of collateral uh, due to vulture capitalism, due to this malevolent strain of capitalism uh, that has come to dominate our, our country. They're not old enough to work, so they don't have any financial leverage in Washington. They are not old enough to vote, so they, they're no constituency at all, and their needs are just collectively and systemically uh, neglected. 
I want to, just as John Kennedy declared, we would land a man on the moon in 10 years. I want my declaration to be that within, every, within 10 years, every public school in America would be a palace of college and learning and the arts. We now have millions of children who go to schools where they don't even have the resources that allow them to read. And if you cannot learn to read by the age of 10, your chances of high school graduation are drastically reduced and your chances of incarceration are drastically increased. So we need a massive transfer of resources in, in the direction of children 10 years old and younger. So major child, one of the things I, I look forward to in the space of possibility of my being president is bringing together the best minds on early childhood. That has to do with nutrition, some of that nutritional issue. We have a high infant mortality rate among black women, a high maternal mortality rate. These things will not be neglected by me. Um, next, I want to declare a climate emergency. We need to ramp down uh, fossil fuel extraction. Uh, President Biden has given more oil drilling permits than even Trump did. Yeah. Plus, he, he okayed the Willow Project. He approved the Willow Project. If you put the Willow Project and... Uh, um, those permits together, they completely nullify the otherwise you know, healthy benefits of the green investments in the Inflation Reduction Act. And of course, he calls himself the climate president because it's a purse thief thing. Look over here. Don't look over there. Look at the green investments. Don't look at how much we are allowing investment in, in the dirty energy. And at this point, it doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. Those guys fall in line with big oil and they fall in line with defense contractors. Yeah. Um, we need an immediate mass mobilization from a dirty economy to a clean economy. So, uh, and I, I don't see how to get there at this point unless we do declare a climate emergency and get on with it. Uh, and the last major pillar uh, of my agenda, um, of course, I stand for reparations and all kinds of things, but the last, a big part of what I think is necessary in order to turn this thing around is we need to end America's war on drugs. Mm -hmm. um, it was started in 1971 by Richard Nixon, who knew that drugs were not uh, America's public enemy number one. He did it in large part, as a matter of fact, as an attack on black communities. Mm -hmm. We spent a trillion dollars. Clearly, we have not solved the problem of drug addiction in America. We, we have exacerbated it. There were 300,000 people in uh, prison when I was in college. There are now 2.3 million and 46% of our federal, uh, federal prisoners are nonviolent drug offenders. The vast majority of them should be home with their children. So for the $100 billion that we spend <coughs> um, on the drug war every year, for a fraction of that, we could have a world-class network of recovery options. We should not be criminalizing drug addiction, which is now an ubiquitous issue in America. It's one of the primary, you know, it's a disease of despair. These are deaths of despair. We should treat it as a health issue, like they do in places like, um, uh, uh, like Portugal. So for me, you know, the presidents have drug czars. I want a recovery czar. Um, so whether it's recovery, whether it's children, whether it's peace, uh, we need to put our focus on our resources in some places uh, that they are not now. In the meantime, short-term profit maximization for huge uh, uh, corporate entities, whether it has to do with insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, big food companies, big agricultural companies, big chemical companies, big oil, gun manufacturers, um, defense contractors, they are a system of economic tyranny. It's why we don't have universal health care. It's why we have over a million people rationing their insulin. It's why we have carcinogens in our food that aren't allowed in other countries. It's why we have chemicals in our pesticides. It's why we have guns flooding our streets. It's why we're ramping up fossil fuels. It's why we fought wars that have nothing to do with, with righteous foreign policy. So we have to see their money, obviously, Citizens United and so forth. And by the way, what I hope a younger generation will do they need to pass an amendment to establish public funding for federal campaigns. I mean, I would like to think it would happen before, but we all know the realities now. Um, this is, you know, this is corporate. It's a system of, of tyranny. When you have short-term corporate profits taking precedence, you know, they have become, that's become our governing principle and it takes precedence over democratic values, over humanitarian values, over the safety, health, and well-being of the American people and our animals and our planet and our future. And we need a president who says so. This incremental approach just means we'll hit the iceberg a little bit later and a different angle. 
but I think that we need a president who lays it down uh, that bluntly and uh, yet sees the transition from a dirty economy to a clean economy, from a war economy to a peace economy. Like, like you and I were talking about, it has to be wise, it has to be responsible. I couldn't in my four years get us completely around the curve, get us completely turned around the ship, but I think I could get us around the curve mm -hmm. and hand it over to a younger generation because it would be their turn. Um, and I believe that, first of all, I believe that everything I just said is the way to be Donald Trump as well. Right. But, I agree uh, with that. Because, yeah. uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt said that the, we would not have a hostile, you know, we would not have a, a, a fascist takeover in the United States as long as democracy delivered on its promises. And what we have now is a country in which democracy doesn't deliver on its promises. We're not going to win in 2024 by warning people or scaring people about Trump. We're going to win by offering people the end to this aberrational chapter of American history, which has moved $50 trillion of wealth away from the bottom 90% of the American people into the hands of 1%, cutting the cord and having a new beginning, a new beginning of hope. You know, Mike, I'm old enough to remember in the 1970s, the average American worker could afford a house and could afford a car and could afford a yearly vacation and could afford for one parent to stay home if they wanted and could afford uh, to send their kids to college because one job could support a family of four. I remember that. And we've just got to cut the cord. There is no negotiating with the, with the malevolence of, a, of, a, of an amoral system that just puts stockholder value above and beyond any, the rights of any other stakeholder or the earth itself. And we need a president who says that. We need a campaigner who says it. We need a person who makes that claim to the American people. Um, and my, my sense of the American people is they're not stupid. Why don't, you know, my father used to say, talk to the smartest person on the jury. Give people a chance to be noble. Give people a chance to be smart. And uh, I believe that's a way to win in 2024. It's, and I don't think anything less than that will win in 2024. And I think probably even more importantly than that, it's the way we'll start to repair the country and have a new beginning. That sounds wonderful. Marianne, I want to thank you so much for coming thank on the program. You. Uh, you you gave us so much time. And on top of that, you let me ask really hard questions. You answered honestly. I really appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a big fan, Mike, and I really appreciate it. I will likewise. Likewise. Thank you.